we'll read our text this morning. Um, I'm thankful for the way God works things out. He uh, kind of stalled me on preaching this. I was supposed to preach this last week. It was ready last Sunday, um, and I wound up preaching the message that I had preached at the uh, youth conference there. And then um, the same thing had happened with uh, Wednesday night's sermon. I had that ready a week ago, and we just preached that last Wednesday night. And I've seen the Lord's hand in it, and I'm glad He stalled me, because in the last week, uh, He's given me, I think, some help on getting through this portion of Scripture. Um, I'm glad I teach through my Bible, or preach through my Bible. Because doing so, like each week we're going through the book of Matthew, you know, for those that don't understand what I'm talking about, we, we pick a book for each of our services. So Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, we're in a different book of the Bible. And I go chapter by chapter through each book of the Bible. And I do that because my commandment from God is to preach the whole counsel of God. And there are some passages I would never preach on if I just kind of picked the theme that was on my heart or the subject on my heart for today or what God showed me this week and bounced around my Bible, which is what I used to do, um, I would, this would never be a passage I would pick to preach out of. It's not easy. But uh, the Lord stalled me a little bit and gave it some time to perk in my soul and show me some things this coming week, and I hope and pray that I can lay it out in a way that will be a help and a blessing to you this morning. Matthew 22, verse number 1, And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding and they would not come. Again he sent forth other servants saying, Tell them which are bidden, behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatlings are killed and all things are ready come unto the marriage. Now notice he said all things are ready, right? So that means the bridegroom is there and he's ready, right? He's got all the dinner prepared, right? So that means who else is already there besides the bridegroom? The bride is there. You understand? You do get what I'm saying, right? Yes. You're, you're what if you're born again this morning? You're the bride of Christ. So he says the dinner's ready. I want somebody to come. Everything's prepared. The bridegroom's there. The bride is there. He's saying, I'm trying to get guests into my wedding. You got that? So watch, back in the text. But they did what? No, um, yeah, I think we read, yes, we read verse 4. Verse 5. But they did what? They made light of it. They made light of it. That's the subject matter I'm going to preach to you on in just a little bit this morning, but I need some time to, to get there. Let's keep reading. And went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise, and the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. When the king heard thereof, he was wroth. He sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid them to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good. You see that? And the wedding was furnished with guests. And the king came in to see the guests. When the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. Ain't that weird? He saith unto him, friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot and take him and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few chosen. Brother Bemis, I got him now. Tried to catch you earlier and you'd stepped out on me. So would you, would you pray for the preaching, please, brother? Thank you. Thank you most of all for Jesus Christ, 
Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Now, as you can tell already, this is not the simplest passage that you could choose to preach from. When I look at it and I read it as I study it, it's actually quite simple, to be honest with you. It's, it's not rocket science. But to break some of these things down, we need God's help this morning. I want to ask you right now, before I even go any further, if you weren't praying while he was praying, I want you to ask God to open up your eyes that you can behold some wondrous things out of his law, out of his word this morning. Because if God opens your eyes to truth, these things will start clicking. And if God the Holy Spirit doesn't teach you what I'm going to try to lay out for you, then you're going to walk out just as confused as you could possibly be. So we're going to start with kind of laying the framework, because I want you to understand doctrinally where this passage fits so that you don't get confused. Once we get through that, I want to make some practical applications out of this passage because there are some definitely good practical applications we can make to our life from this passage of Scripture. First of all, I want you to know this. In the passage that we just read, there is a a seedbed in here for a lot of false doctrines. Now, that's not saying the Word of God is the seed. That's saying that a lot of people that believe false doctrines root some of their doctrines in this passage of Scripture, and I'm going to show you how they do that and and what different views come from this passage. And I want to show you why that is so absolutely wrong, okay? Here's the thing that we all got to understand this morning. Forgive me for those of you that already know this, but for the sake of trying to make sure that everybody gets the most they can out of this, I need to say this. Every false doctrine, okay, every cult... Sometime or another, they will root what they believe back in the Bible. So they'll open up their Bible and they'll show you a verse of Scripture from the Bible and they'll say, this is why we believe there we're part of the 144,000. I can take you to verses and show you that there is 144,000. But what they do is they pull that passage out of its context And then they use it privately, interpreting that little piece the way they want to interpret it based on what they want to believe. That's coming from God only knows what. (laughs) A personal agenda, a desire to reject the truth, a desire to get along with their friends or family members that believe this way, a deception from the devil. God only knows what the root of that is. But any way you cut it, it is wicked. It is the devil's way of using God's word to mess you up. When he tempted Jesus Christ, he quoted Bible to him. So what they'll do is they'll pull that passage out. The other thing you'll notice they will not do is they will not show you another passage that goes with that passage and teach you where that fits in. Almost every time if you go and say, listen, I have a question about that, you're going to notice the more you question, the more frustrated and angry that they get. When a guy starts getting mad at you for questioning when he's talking supposedly on behalf of Almighty God, Did you grab a hold of that this morning? When a man gets up in a pulpit to speak or gets behind a Bible to teach in the name of God, he ought never get upset with you if you're sincerely looking for truth. Listen, if you're being a moron, I can figure that out pretty quick. And I know exactly how to handle morons. I'm actually really good at it in the flesh. I don't even think the Lord's taught me how to do it. I think I'm naturally very good at handling morons. Honestly, I like to fight. Now, here we're not supposed to be fighting, amen? But I do. I mean, I'm, I'm good with it. But when somebody's really seeking the truth, a preacher ought never be impatient and frustrated with you because you're not getting it. He ought to know his Bible well enough to be able to say, this is why I believe what I believe. Can I show you another passage? Let me show you something else. Do you, does that make sense to you? Well, I'm not getting it. No problem. Pray on it. I'll be praying for you. Let's talk again. But you will notice, man, when they go to some of these passages and they try to privately interpret it and force you to see it their way, they get real upset. It's one of the ways I figured out I was in the wrong Bible college because I'd ask my professors questions and they'd get mad and even yell at me in class in front of them, start trying to humiliate me and belittle me, trying to set me and my girlfriend, who's now my wife, up in front of everybody to make us look like our testimony was wrong. It was a pure setup. 100% 100% set up, and her and I both knew it because I'd been asking questions about the Bible. 
I dug up some stuff. She told her dad. Her dad called and threw a big fit, and they turned it on us. And I mean, it, it got ugly, you know, like the Christian mafia kind of stuff. But I called my preacher. My mom said, you need to call him. I called Brother Lentz, and he'd say, hey, man, how you doing? You good? Good. What do you want? <laughs> I'd tell him my question. Yeah, he'd just answer all my questions when I'd argue, debate, or get little, you know, back and forth with him. He had the discernment to know I really was seeking for truth. I just needed the rough edges knocked off, and he was the guy to do it. And he helped me out, and he'd say, give me a call. If you got any more questions, man, I'll give you some more ammo. I wish he was still alive. I'd love for you to hear him preach. He'd be 71 or 72 right now. But man, that was the first time, I mean, the first time it really hit me that a man who really knows the truth and loves the Bible and cares about me does not mind me asking him questions and has no problem answering them. I appreciated that about him. I want you to see this passage because this passage does bring up a lot of questions. One of the first false doctrines that I do not want anybody that is a member of my church that faithfully attends here to ever get caught in is the false doctrine of post-millennialism. Here's what that means. It, they believe that the millennium is an era, not necessarily a literal thousand years, regardless of what the Bible teaches. Regardless of what the Bible very literally and clearly and simply says. They say the reign of Jesus Christ, the millennium that's coming in the future, during which right Christ will reign over the earth, is not a literal or earthly throne, but a gradual increase of the gospel, they always say it that way. Really, I mean, you, you learn after a little while some of the tricks of the trade, man. I can spot a fraud, can't you? Amen. How many of you gone to go buy a used car and some used car salesman that you know could care less? Hi, they, over there, the kids, hi, honey, oh, you are so beautiful. What's your name? You know, I want to I mean, I want to say, you know what, this guy's a fake. Let's just leave. Right. Right. Yes, sir. Can't you spot him after a little while? You ought to be able to spot a fraud when they open up the Bible. Regardless of what the Bible actually says, they say that but the, through the gradual increase of the gospel, some of the same guys will publicly be called on to pray and they'll say, Lord, help us to increase thy kingdom. Well, what are you talking about, man? What they literally believe is they're bringing in the kingdom by spreading the gospel. And it's power to change lives. Hey, fellas, how's that been working for you? The gradual Christianization of the world. How's that been working for you, guys? People still believe this stuff in spite of what they're seeing around them today, in spite of the fact that the Bible says evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse deceiving and being deceived. They think we're Christianizing the world. They lost their minds, man. Christ will return and immediately, once we've Christianized the world, usher the church into their eternal state after judging the wicked. This is called post-millennialism. Because by its view, Christ will return after the millennium. In other words, we are bringing it in. There's a very short step between that and Roman Catholicism where they conquered in this name. There's a short step between that and Islam where they conquer in this name. They're going to go and they're going to force the whole world to convert. Folks, that is such unbelievably false doctrine. There is a millennial reign of Jesus Christ coming. He is going to rule and reign on this planet that you're on right now for a thousand years. He's going to sit on a throne in Jerusalem and he's going to fix all the mess you got around you now and he's going to rule and he's going to reign for a thousand years. Don't you ever let anybody use any passage of scripture to talk you out of that because it's not Bible. It's perverting the word of God. Number two, our millennialists. They go to this passage and they use this passage to say there's no millennium. They believe in a literal reign of Christ, yes, along with his resurrected saints, but that this reign is a heavenly one rather than on this earth. They believe it's a present day reality. You, you, do you feel like Jesus Christ is the one ruling and reigning on this planet right now? No, sir. I mean, come on, man. How can you in your right mind, very intelligent people, by the way, I'm not saying they're stupid, 
and, and I also want to clarify this. A lot of people sit in those churches and literally don't know any better. So you can't just like paint this broad brush over all the individuals. I'm talking to you this morning about the doctrine and any man that'll try to teach you that doctrine. That's a wolf. And I know he's a wolf because he corrects the word of God to make it fit his agenda and then finds passages to twist. And what they do is they make light of the word of God. When you come to them and say, what about that right there? Look at how plain and clear that is. They'll say, oh, that's an unfortunate rendering. Oh, well, that doesn't mean that. That's actually just a picture. It's just a type. It doesn't mean what it says. Okay, so if there's pictures and types all over, right, and there's no way to find out where God was or wasn't calling it a picture or a type, do you know there's a way to know when God's using a picture and a type? And there's a way to know when he's not? How about this one? There was a certain rich man. And a beggar. The rich man died. He was in hell. Here's a certain individual. That's not a picture. That's not a type. That's not an allegory. Oh, that's not a real person. Where? Where in the text does it say it's not? When the God uses like or as, he's showing you a similitude. When you don't see like or as in there, it's not just a picture. They go over to Re Revelation because they're so daft they can't understand what they read. And since they can't understand what they're reading because none of it fits their agenda, they tell you, oh, that's all just a type. That's not a beast coming up out of the pit. and That's not supernatural beings flying around the planet like it clearly says there is. That's, that's a helicopter. Wh where do you get that from? That's not what God said in the text. They, I'm sick of watching preachers try to class up the Bible. This book is so real, it fits right into modern-day America with all the debauchery going on around you. The book fits. And it fits your life this morning. Our millennialists believe that he's reigning now. They just believe it's a heavenly one rather than an earthly one. They believe it's a present-day reality. And they also believe that all believers in particular, those who are dead with Christ, are in it. It's a present-day reality. All believers, but particularly the dead ones, are in it. Man, I'm so confused. Like, can you please open the Bible and show me where this is at? Because this little dream world that they would use this text to prove is a twisting. It's a reading it the way your human mind sees it or wants to see it. That's not anywhere in the text. Here's the last one, and this one I won't spend much time on because it's so funny. It's, it's literally... Hilarious. I mean, somebody had to be doing drugs when they came up with this one. The Baptist briders get from this passage that if you're saved but not a member of a Baptist church, you are not part of the bride, you're one of the guests at the supper. In other words, since we're not in a Baptist church, we're not in the bride. So let me ask you a question. How many of you know what the Southern Baptists are? Let me see your hand. Not down South Baptists. Southern Baptists exist up here. Let me see your hands. Less than half of the people in the room. The Southern Baptist Convention is nothing like it used to be 50 or 100 years ago. Some of them are now debating or arguing about whether or not it's okay to marry homosexuals, and some of them actually do. Some of them now have female pastors. Wait a second. The name of our church is Bible Believers Church because we believe the Bible is the word of God. So I'm not a part of the bride. I guess I'm going to be waiting on that born-again guy who was correcting the Bible to that extent. At the, you know, I'm going to be a guest. Hey, at least I'm in. You know what I mean? I can't wait to accidentally trip and spill a whole picture of grape juice all over his white robes. That's a bunch of foolishness. You can't find any evidence in the Bible for it. There is no evidence for it. I mean, listen, that goofy doctrine that says the Baptist church started with John the Baptist is a little bit more palatable than this foolishness. And you can tell him I said so. And you can remind yourself when something like that comes across your plate that that is a gross twisting and misinterpretation of the word of God. There's nothing in that passage that says anything even remotely similar to what they're teaching you. You guys see how to judge truth versus error? Yes. You got to have that book in your lap. Right. You got to open it up. You got to study it. You got to compare scripture with scripture. 
Can I show you something real quick? Let's go over to Revelation. I want you to see something. Revelation chapter number 20. I think you'll find this interesting because it's quite simple. We're in Revelation. Don't panic. Okay? Don't be like, oh, no, I'm not going to understand anything he's about to say. Revelation is not hard to understand. Can I please say that again because I want you to hear it. Revelation is not hard to understand. Watch it. It is hard to believe. If you'll believe what you read, you will understand what you're reading. Now, here's the interesting thing. Watch this connection. The book of Revelation, God says, if you'll read this book, you'll get a special blessing, right? I got chewing on that because that seemed to me to be a little like, I just, it's strange, right? How is it that if I read the book of Revelation, I supposedly get a blessing? Watch this. Revelation opens up Daniel. If you read and understand Revelation, you'll be able to get a lot more out of Daniel. Daniel opens up Matthew. So if you read Revelation, believe it, then read Daniel and interpret Daniel in the light of Revelation, you'll get a lot more out of it. Then you interpret Matthew in the light of Daniel, you get a lot more out of it. But Matthew opens up two other books that are major stumbling blocks when it comes to false doctrine. You know what they are? Acts and Hebrews. God says, if you read this book, you're going to get a special blessing. Reading the book of Revelation, there's something in it for you. And most Christians will live their whole life and never understand why that thing's a blessing. That book, Revelation, unlocks so many other things. It even comes all the way back and helps us begin to understand the book of Matthew. If you'll believe what you read and leave it alone, don't correct it, don't change it. And if it challenges your mind, get your mind in line with God. Don't make your own interpretation interpretation of God's word or you'll wind up in all kinds of false doctrine revelation chapter 20 and I saw an angel come down from heaven no problem having a key having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand what's well what, what does that mean it means an angel comes down from heaven with the key to the bottomless pit and a chain and he laid hold on the dragon What's that, a dinosaur? No, it's the dragon. That old serpent, which is called the devil and Satan. Guys, what's the dragon? I mean, he went through extensive lengths when he followed the Holy Spirit of God in putting down what this is so we know that's the devil. So far, I mean, not rocket science, right? I'm not trying to be a jerk or overly sarcastic this morning, but I'm kind of getting into this. I mean, I'm sorry, but that's pretty obvious. Amen. And bound him. Well, that's an era. That's a time period. That's now. Guys, we're in the millennium. The devil is bound. No wonder it's so easy to serve Jesus and there's no pressure and there's no temptation and nobody's killing anybody and nobody's raping anybody and nobody's slaughtering little kids and there's no human trafficking and there's no messed up people in the head because Satan is bound. You do get my absolute, complete and total nauseating level of sarcasm this morning, don't you? Guys, that's not happened yet. That's why the Bible tells you he's the God of this world. Right now, the Lucifer's running the show and is trying to blind people's eyes from the truth. And Jesus Christ came so you can have light. Yes. And he gave you that book because that book is light. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. That Bible is supposed to shine into you and show you who Jesus Christ is and where you're going when you die and what you need in this life. That book will direct you and guide you if you'll let that book speak to you. But here we are. We're all going to change it because that's super unpalatable. I mean, really? The bottomless pit? I mean, come on. Not, not, you know, hellfire and damnation, that's old school. It's old school, but it's still good school. It's old school, but it's still Bible truth. Verse 3, and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up. Set a seal upon him. Why? Because he ain't running the show anymore. Jesus Christ is ruling and reigning in Jerusalem. That he should deceive the nations no more till when? Folks, how do you make that figurative? That is literal. 
You have to play mental gymnastics and be a dishonest, lying, conniving, Bible-twisting, God-rejecting fool to say that that's anything but what he said it is. Then what's going to happen? After that, he must be loosed a little season. He's, he's going to let him go for a little while. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Now, for the sake of time, I just got to tell you, we'll, we'll teach through this sometime you know, in the near future, Lord willing. But in verse number four, that is tribulation saints. You and I are already in heaven. So that's people in the tribulation period that died for their faith. They refused to receive the mark. They got their heads cut off. And what's he going to do? They're going to get resurrected and they're going to live and reign with Christ a thousand years. Verse 5, but the rest of the dead, those that rejected, live not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that, taketh, that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. The second death we're going to see in just a minute is eternity in the lake of fire. This is the first resurrection. Uh, verse 6, Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection, and such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. When the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison, and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog. We've all heard that. You can't watch TV without hearing that. To gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the, camp of the saints about, that's Jerusalem, and the beloved city. See, it's Jerusalem. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. That's going to be cool, man. You, you think you've seen a bomb before? You ain't seen no bomb. I could care less what goes on over there in Russia and what they start launching at each other. It's nothing like what you're going to see here. I mean, just kaboom! And there's just millions of whatever they are just frying up, man. We're going to be like, whoa! You ain't going to be all like northern and classy at that moment. I'm telling you right now, you ain't going to be. There's going to be a little bit of savage in all of us. Verse 10, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the heaven and the earth fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great. That doesn't mean little and big. That means insignificant people and great important people. doesn't matter. You're all going to be equal when you stand before the great white throne judgment. If you're saved, you won't stand here. If you're lost, if you're here this morning and Christ is not your Savior, you will stand before this throne. You understand that? I don't have time to go through and teach you all there is there. I can answer questions later, but I don't have time to teach it all this morning. If you're not saved, you're going to stand before the great white throne judgment. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their... And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. All these people telling you about works-based salvation. Are you nuts? I don't want you to judge me based on my works, God. I want you to judge me based on the perfect work of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, my Savior. Verse 14, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is what? The second death. You know, you're all going to die. Every one of you is going to die. Not one person in this room won't die unless the rapture happens. Why are you going to die? Because you're a sinner. The wages of sin is death. The payment for sin. The reason we all die is that's God's stamp of approval on the fact that every last man, woman, child is a sinner. That's why you have a date with death. So what you need is to be born again. Ain't it funny Hollywood puts out movies making fun of born again? Christian Mel, you born again, you born again, born too. And nowadays they're even taking that phrase and perverting it. Reborn, reborn. Like not even talking about salvation. That's a weird thing, ain't it? The devil tries to get people so used to these exclusive King James tr phrases and words and Bible words that they're, they got the immunization so when the true conviction comes by, they can't feel it. You better get born again because if you are born once, everybody in this room been born once? Yes, sir. That's a trick question, right? 
If all you ever born is once, you're going to die two times. You're going to die physically, and then you're going to die spiritually in the lake of fire forever. But if you're born again, Nicodemus, you must be born again. If you've been born once physically and born again spiritually, you're only going to die one time. You ain't going here. Verse 15, whosoever was found, not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. So Revelation chapter 20 makes it abundantly clear that that millennium is a 1,000 year reign of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Yes, it's not that hard, is it? Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, please. On our way back to Matthew, we'll go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. I want you to start with me in verse number 1. I'm going to repeat this because it's important, and I mean, I, I think it's extremely important that somehow or another, with the help of God, I get it through, not only to all the adults in the room, but that the young people in the room just start getting it. What we're here for, and what is church about, and what does it mean to be a pastor and a preacher? Why do we come? Why do we bring our Bible? Why are the lights on and the shades up? Why isn't it dark? Why are we all open in our Bibles? Listen to me, if you can't turn because you're newer, which a lot of more people in this room are than what you think. Newer people look around and go, everybody gets this. Not everybody. There's quite a few new people. And there's a lot of people around you that a year or two ago couldn't have kept up with turning to these passages. Amen. So just sit and listen and pay attention and get what you can get. But we open our Bibles and turn because we want to see what he's saying right. and learn that book. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, which shall be able to teach others also. What we're doing this morning is trying to, to teach you the Bible as God's allowed me to be taught it. So i got to pass it on. Go down with me, if you would, to verse number 11. It is a faithful saying, For if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. What's the qualification for reigning? Suffering. Why do I suffer? I'm not going to a mission field. I don't really think I suffer for the Lord. He's been so good to me. Wait a second. Are you trying to do right? I didn't ask you if you're a street preacher and if you're the world's greatest soul winner and if you're giving and if you're doing all this stuff. Are you trying to do right? Are you living in a sinful flesh? Every day you tell your flesh no when you tell the Holy Spirit of God yes, you're suffering for Jesus Christ. I think sometimes people's minds, or maybe it's the preacher's fault, I don't know, but I've noticed a lot of people think the bar is so high that they feel like they can't get over it. And I'm here to tell you, you don't have that kind of a Savior. Amen. He would never tell you how to do something, tell you to do something, and then not tell you how to do it. And he would never ask you to do something you can't realistically do. There's not a person in this room that can't suffer for Jesus Christ, even if you're not called to preach, you're not gifted to be a great witness, you're not doing all the things you feel like you're supposed to do because you've heard it preached. If you're just doing the best you can in your personal life, around your house, with your children, your spouse, your whatever, and just trying to do right and keep yourself clean, that is suffering. Because your flesh don't like it. If you came this morning and didn't feel like it, or found the devil giving you a little bit of a time trying to get here, I don't know if I'm alone on that, but you came anyways. You know what you did? You crucified the flesh. Good for you. If you read your Bible some days when you don't really feel like it or get on your knees and try to pray and feel like, man, I didn't do a very good job, but I tried. Good for you. He said, if you suffer, you shall also reign with him. Now, watch this. There's no new sentence here. Still one sentence. If we deny him, he also will deny us. See that? You lose your salvation if you deny the Lord. Wait a second, you just pulled that phrase out and interpreted it however you wanted. What does it say in context? In context, he's talking about an opportunity to reign. He ain't talking about your eternal soul going to hell. If you deny him the right he has to run your life, I said it like that. Don't that rub you the wrong way? That's your flesh. If you deny him the right he has to run your life, he said he'll deny you context, an opportunity to reign with him. You'll be there. You just lost your chance to reign. Because look at verse 13. If we believe not... Anybody know people that were born again that say they don't even believe anymore? I know some. Look at it. Yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny 
himself. You know what you are? You're his body. You're his bride. These two shall be one flesh. You're in him and he's in you. So you can walk away and say, I don't even believe anymore. I don't, I don't, I don't. He's like, all right, well, I'm going to knock the snot out of you and you don't have any reward when you get here and you ain't reigning with me, but I'm not going to deny what's mine. Now watch. Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. That's what I'm doing this morning. All millennials, post millennials, Baptist bride, blah, blah, blah. Don't strive about these words these men are making up trying to mess your minds up. Do I talk plain to you? Yes, sir. On purpose? I'm not the smartest guy around, but I couldn't mem memorize these 25 cent words to make you think that I'm real, you know, spiritual and this great Bible scholar. And that doesn't do you any good. What good's it going to do you if I tell you, well, this could also be rendered? And, you know, just making myself look like I'm something great. No, I'm not here to do that. I'm not here to subvert you. I want you to learn that book and your confidence in God's word to grow with time. Amen. And he says this, verse 15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You know, he told the guy how to study his Bible. So that's why when I come over to Matthew and I say, this isn't applying to you doctrinally. This is applying to something else doctrinally, the kingdom of heaven versus the kingdom of God. And we show you those differences where you can lose your salvation. This passages say this, and why is that not to us? Let me show you who that is to and why we have eternal security. Let me show you where that is in your Bible. What, what am I doing? You know by watching me rightly divide that I am following God's rules for interpreting his word. Yeah. It's right there. Yeah. You don't interpret it how you want. You rightly divide it. Why? Because the author of the book said to do it that way. You know what I found very interesting? The more I read my Bible, and, I, and I'm not going to tell you how many times I read it through cover to cover, but I read it through a lot. And the more I read my Bible, the more it feels like little light bulbs just keep going off and stuff that used to confuse me. I'm like, I know how he talks. I know exactly what that's saying. And then I find somebody older and better than me at this stuff, and I ask them, get yeah, rip right on. I'm like, man, that's cool. It's like you're getting this relationship going with the individual. You better know the author of the book. And then you better interpret the book the way he says to interpret it, or you're going to be off in left field somewhere, not knowing where you're at, and turning on the news and, oh, no, the Antichrist is coming. Oh, no, the mark. Oh, no, the vaccine. Oh, no, the boosters. Oh, no, the variants. Get over it. Amen. Is Putin gogging? Is this gogging me, gog? Pass the salt. Let's go to the gym. Why? Because it's not even worthy of a response. Can't be Gog and Magog. The Lord hasn't been reigning for a thousand years. The devil didn't just come up and drag a bunch of people to surround and attack Jerusalem. The book says what it says. So you just relax in Jesus knowing you ain't looking for the Antichrist. You're looking for Jesus Christ. He's going to get you out of here. These guys that just subverted you and made you scared and worried about this stuff. Verse 16, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. I don't get into big Bible debates. I'm not on Facebook wasting hours that I desperately need for other things like getting ready for this. Debating a bunch of goofballs. Honestly, get a life, man. Don't even bother on those blogs. These guys need to, you know what? I, I mean, the only comment that needs to be made is, all you fellas need to get off this site and go spend time with your family if you want to fulfill the will of God, smart aleck. I'm not impressed with your Bible knowledge. I don't really want a bunch of debating back and forth. Amen. I'm not saying that to you. I'm saying it to that attitude. The Bible's preaching against it, this passage. Their world will eat as doth a canker. Like cancer, the, the dead meat, the dead garbage living off the good. That kind of stuff will start spreading through the church and all the deadheads are living off the people that are just needing to come like, man, I just need some help. You know, I'm struggling. I need some direction. I don't know what phase I'm going through right now, and it's horrible. I just want to get something from God. I don't care about your pet doctrine. Their word eats, and then he names a couple people. That's pretty rough, ain't it? Of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus. Now watch this, verse 18. Who concerning the truth have erred, saying... 
that the resurrection is past already. I read the resurrection to you over there in Revelation 20. And overthrow the faith of some. Back to Matthew chapter 22. So, to make it shorter, the message shorter, you know this. When the Lord rose from the dead, disciples are standing there. They said, why stand you gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which is gone, so so come in like manner, right? Yeah. said, go get busy. Why? Because he's coming. You're looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, right? The last trump, the trump of God shall sound, the dead shall be raised and corrupt, but we shall be changed. He's coming in the clouds before the great tribulation. He's not appointed us in wrath, but to obtain salvation to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You're looking for Jesus. You're not worried about whether or not we're in the millennium, whether or not we're in the tribulation, whether or not this is the beginning of sorrows. This is the beginning of sorrows. This is the beginning of sorrows. Let's go to the text. You know what the problem with all these guys is? There's one common denominator. They all made light of the truth of God. Every amillennialist, postmillennialist, every, every Bible rejecter, every Bible corrupter, the root of the problem is they made light of the word of God. They go to a passage that's as clear as a bell and they say that's actually an allegory. That doesn't mean, that's not what that means. That's what it says, that's not what it means. They made light of the word of God. So let's make, quickly, let's make some practical application to you and I. Because we know doctrinally this isn't speaking to us. Look at this quick. I'm going to rip down through this and I'm going to show you the doctrine here. Are you ready? Verses 1 and 2 is Jesus Christ. The, Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son. That's God the Father making a marriage for Jesus Christ. Got it? Verses 3 through 7 is the unbelieving Jews rejecting Jesus Christ and killing his servants. And consequently, in 70 AD, their city was destroyed. Go, watch, go read history. Their city was destroyed. Paul hasn't been saved yet. The mystery of the church hasn't been revealed yet. It, it, it's very normal in these passages before Paul and in the Old Testament for God to take the first advent, which is when Jesus came as a baby in a manger and died on a cross, and then loop him, hook him right in like that with the second advent, which is when he comes back yet in the future that has not happened yet. These Old Testament passages, you'll see the first and second advent together. They won't show you the church age in between because it came later as a mystery once the Jews rejected. You're that mystery Paul made clear to us. Did you follow that? Mostly? Okay. What you have in this passage is the same thing. So in verses 3 through 6, you're going to notice the, Jew, the, the, uh, the uh, Jews make light of it, reject him. Look at verse 3. He sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding. They would not come. The Jews rejected Jesus Christ. Again, he sent forth other servants. Tell them that are bidden, behold, I prepared my dinner, my oxen, my fatlings are killed. All things are ready. Come into the marriage. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. The remnant took his ser servants and, and treated them spitefully and slew them. When the king heard thereof, he was wroth. He sent his armies and destroyed those murders and build, burned their cities. So all the way through the Old Testament, the Jews rejected the prophets, rejected the servants, killed them, killed them, rejected them. Jesus came. They slew him. The father said, you just killed my son. You crossed a line. All right, fine. He gives them another chance early on in the New Testament. They don't take it. By 70 A.D., the whole city gets burned to the ground. They get slaughtered. There's your, this is your doctrinal application of this. Look at verses 8 through 10. Then saith he to his servants, the wedding is ready. You know what he did between verse 7 and verse 8? Just being God himself. He just took one long step, stepped over 2,000 years. Between verse 7, when they got destroyed by killing Jesus Christ at the first coming, and verse 8, you jump a 2,000 year period where you and I are sitting right there between verse 7 and verse 8 right now. He's not dealing with the Gentiles here. He's dealing with the Jews, see? Stepped over the Gentiles in 7 and 8. Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they that were bidden were not worthy. I went to the Jews, and they didn't come. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So the servants went out into the highways. It's just regular old nobodies like me and you, Gentile dogs. 
that God said, these people ain't never lived by the law. They've never been worthy. They've never done right. Look at what a mess these people are. When God sent the Jews into the Gentiles' land, he said, slaughter them all because they were so filthy and undefiled and, and, and defiled and wicked. Even animals had been defiled by the sins of men. You get what I'm talking about? You understand where, we're at, where America is almost at, if not there already? He said, you know what? You guys don't want it. You don't suffer yourself to be too good for it. I'll go to the Gentiles. And he brings in them that were not worthy. He says, go ye therefore into the highways, as many as ye shall find, bid them to the marriage. So the servants went out to the highways, gathered together as many as they shall find, both bad and good. And the wedding was furnished with guests. Now, let's make this application to us, taking the things of God lightly. Look at verse 5. They made light of it. How's that? Because in verse number 3, when he calls them, they're bidden to the wedding, they would not. In verse number 5, they made light of it and did what? Went their own way. How do you and I make light of the truth God's given us? We like light of it by rejecting His will for our own will. When God says, here's what I want you to do, Reagan, and I say, yeah, but I'd rather. Here's the next step in your life, Mike. Okay, God, but I'm not ready for that commitment. Here's what I want you to do. I hear it, but I, you know what? I don't think I can. God, God says, this is my will for you. Yeah, but that's not my will for myself. Whenever you and I know God wants us to do something or know God wants us to not do something and we don't do it or we continue to do it, we are making light of who God Almighty is and saying, not thy will, but my will be done. I don't like the way this is making me look. I don't like what this is asking of me. I don't think I'm capable. I don't want to do it. I don't like that. Get off my back. And what you're saying is, I'm my God, and you're not. But thanks for the fire insurance. That is somebody that genuinely makes light of Almighty God. And I'll, be, I'll submit to you, now without preaching at you, I'll submit to you that in one way or another, we all do it on a fairly regular basis. It's that battle between your flesh and the Spirit of God. Because your, your flesh wants to go one way and the Spirit of God's telling you to go another way and those two can't get along. You understand that? <laughs> So the more you feed the black dog, which is your flesh, the stronger the black dog is going to get. And that's why it's important you're here this morning because you're trying to feed the white dog. Because the Spirit of God and your flesh don't want to do the same thing. And the more you feed the white dog, the more it's going to grow. That's why I recommend to you, I'm not harping on you, but I recommend to you to listen to music that's going to feed the white dog. Good night, man. If you struggle with depression, don't listen to blues or jazz, or country. Come on now, think about it. You feed that. So if you get in your car and you go, you know what, I have liberty to turn on other stuff as long as it's not vulgar and vile. I mean, come on, some, some stuff I don't have to preach on, right? You, you Christians listening to gangster rap or heavy metal or death metal, come on, man. You don't need me to even tell you. The Holy Ghost already told you a million times and you just, not thy will, but mine be done. I like this stuff. You're making light of God. But there's some of that, well, hey, this isn't that bad. Okay, but what do you want to feed? The flesh or the spirit? You got plenty of time to get on Facebook and Instagram and news and all that stuff, but we don't have time to read our Bibles? What are you feeding? You see, the two can't get along. So it's a daily choice of whether or not I'm going to yield to the spirit of God and crucify the flesh, which is suffering, and I'm going to get to reign with him, or whether I give in to the flesh all the time. And I'll I, I just tell you, man, we, we give in to the flesh an awful lot, don't we? That's making light of it. That's what they did. It's that simple. Let me move to my next point, because i got to get you out of here. My introduction was 90% of the message. You make light of God when you take the things of God lightly, when he convicts you and you don't take it serious. You make light of God when you tick the father off and you don't care. You hear what I said? When you tick the father off and you don't care. Look at verse 7. When the father heard it, he was wroth. You know what they've been doing? They were so wicked in verse number 6. So wicked that they attacked the men he sent to help them. 
and didn't think a thing of it. Let me ask you a good question. This is a good question I want to ask you, and I'm serious. Do you understand what the fear of the Lord is? Are you afraid of him? Perfect love, cast out fear, because fear is eternity. He fears not me, perfect in love. I can quote it too. If you're quoting it with that spirit, that's because you're making light of him. Let me tell you something about God. I'm afraid of him. A God, a God is love. Yeah, I, know, I know a lot about God's love. And listen, when I'm afraid of him, and when I'm trying to yield to him and not taking him lightly, I bask in his love. It's a wonderful place to be. I'm thankful for it. But I'm telling you this much. I am very seriously afraid of letting my flesh take his way. Of taking the preaching in the Bible lightly. Of overstepping what I should be doing and getting out of the will of God. I'm afraid of taking lightly the position and the opportunity God gives me to be your pastor and preach the Bible to you. I'm afraid of taking lightly the relationship that I have with my wife and the faithfulness that we've had for each other for almost 20 years now. I'm afraid of taking lightly my testimony for your children and for the future of this ministry and for the glory of God Almighty. I am afraid of what God would do to me if I mess up. Sorry, I need that. <laughs> I'm probably a little more of a maverick, a little more of a thick-headed idiot than some of you, but I need to know that he's God and that if he's mad, it ain't going my way. But nowadays, you're not taught that. You're not preached that. Actually, when somebody does preach that, what do they do? They scorn them. They mock them. They make fun of them. They belittle them. They throw them away. They say, oh, that's not New Testament Christianity. It's a God is love. I'm just glad God loves me no matter what. Party on. Okay, you do your thing, but I ain't going down that road with you because I know him, and I'd rather stay in his love. I don't, want his, I don't want his judgment on my life. But they tick the father off. They find fault with the son, and they kill the son. My last point. You take the things of God lightly when you think you can do it yourself. Look at verse 11. The king came in to see the guests. He saw there a man which had not a wedding garment on. Now, that's, a, that's an interesting one. I, I, I'll refrain from getting into it right now, because if I do, it's going to take me a lot longer to describe to you than what I have time for, but that's a real interesting one. He walks in, and there's somebody there that doesn't have the right robes on. He said, friend, how'd you get in here? I think, he, I think, I think in my opinion, I think he let him in. He let it happen because he was ready to make an example of him. He said, friend, how'd you get in here? And guess what? He was what? Speechless. Somebody didn't put on the righteousness they were supposed to put on and tried to walk into that wedding anyhow with their own righteousness. Well, my good works outweigh my bad works, and I turned my life around, and I got in church, and I even gave to that church. I mean, they, they were going to put an addition on, and I tried to help that church out. Hey, man. God don't need that. God needs your heart. And if God's in it, God will pay the bills. I've learned that over and over and over and over and over and over and over again for 14 years. And any time I got my mind off it a little bit, God had a way of smacking me right back on center, man. It's amazing. It ain't about any of that. Well, I was faithful and I sat under good hard preaching, man. I took it. Maybe you just do that because you like the, the macho, yeah, we have hard preaching. That doesn't mean your heart's right. Now, most people taking this kind of preaching regularly, that means something. But some people, it doesn't. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, you're not going to get any credit with God based on yourself. It's about Jesus Christ, his son. You better make sure that when you stand before the Lord, you say, Lord, what I got on is not the robes of my own righteousness. It's not by works of righteousness, which I have done. By your mercy, you saved me. I, I, I took the robe of Jesus Christ. I'm a new man because of your son. I trusted your son as my savior. But you go in there with your own robes of righteousness. Can I say this? We know that about the lost, right? That they need the righteousness of Jesus Christ through salvation. Am I right? Yes, sir. Okay. Christian, aren't you told to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling? For it's God that works in you to both to will and to do with his good pleasure. Aren't you told that your works do matter after you're saved? Yes, sir. 
wait a second. <laughs> if my works are filthy rags for salvation, how is it that in my own power after salvation, I'm ever going to fulfill the works that God wants me to fulfill? In other words, it's the Spirit of God in you that produces anything in you that is good. Does that make sense? I'm trying to do right. Yeah, and if I do right, it is because God worked in me both to will my desire and to do to get it done of his good pleasure. Too much of our Christian life is spent trying to do the right things. That is just nothing more than the robes of our own righteousness. Rather than submitting to the one, walking with the one, fellowshipping with the one, drawing closer to the one who actually does the work in us anyhow. I cannot pastor this church. I cannot get the next message ready. I can't do it. But when I submit to him, when I let him lead and guide, when I try to walk with him and follow him, he can do amazing things with a little vessel like me when he's in control. I have to take this serious. What we're doing this morning is not a light thing. What we're doing this morning is not just a, a cultural thing. What we're doing this morning is eternal. It is real. If you're not saved this morning, let me tell you something. Your soul is real. You are going to live eternally somewhere. You need to know what the Bible says about salvation. And I promise you, I can show you and answer your question. And if you say, you're nuts, I don't want none of it, I'll say, Here's my cell phone number. Keep it. If you ever change your mind, give me a call. You need to know. And if you're here this morning and you are saved, you're the last person in this room that should take lightly what Jesus Christ did for you. You're the last person in this room that should be eh, not too concerned about whether or not God's mad at you. Living how you want refusing to surrender and follow him, going your own way, not being worried about whether or not you've ticked off the one that saved you, the one who can end your life with a thought. You're the last person in this room who should think you can do it, fix it, accomplish it yourself. If you came to such a desperate point, you fell on your face asking God to wash you clean of your sin and save your eternal soul from hell, then you should maintain that same humble, desperate spirit and saying, God, I need your help. I don't care where you're at in life. I don't care what your circumstances are. You look around you and you recognize you need the help of God. And you take him lightly when you think you don't. Let's stand to our feet this morning with our heads bowed and our eyes closed.